welcome to, to this workshop. We are Anthony and I am Israel. So today we're going to be developing a streaming pipeline in Python uh, step by step. Anthony and I work as uh, data engineers in Google Cloud, uh, professional services. So we work with uh, Dataflow and Apache Beam quite a lot. Um, and normally we, we find a lot of uh, problems with the streaming pipelines, uh, mainly not so much uh, because of, um, of um, the difficulty of the problem itself, it's more about the difficulty of uh, streaming concepts. So this, this workshop is uh, an introductory workshop to all these streaming concepts and how these are uh, used and implemented with Python in, in, in Apache Bean. It's going to be totally generic and you are going to be able to run it in local, everything, okay? So um, uh, using unit testing, um, so it's going to be an emulation of real streaming, but everything that we are do doing here, uh, you will be able to run it in Dataflow as well or any other runner, so following the instructions that we provide. So without further introductions, um, this, is the, this is where the interesting stuff is, okay? So I'm going to start with a presentation uh, around streaming. So while I speak, if you want, you can just uh, download the repo and start setting it up. Uh, you need to have a Python development environment um, of your choice. So as long as it's able to run Python and you are comfortable writing code with it, it should work for, for the workshop. Um, we will give more details about this uh, at the end, okay? And this is like a teaser of the thing that we're going to be doing here. So that's going to be the output of this uh, workshop, okay? So like an interactive visualization tool with taxi data from the New York City um, that has been processed in our pipeline in streaming. Uh, the QR code is for, for the GitHub repo, okay? So if you have the chance, so please um, uh, download it and uh, make sure that you have the, uh, the, 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 um, the repo ready for, for the rest of the workshop that is going to be hands-on, I promise, okay? I'm going to shut, shut up uh, soon, okay? Don't look at it too much, okay? Because in some parts of the repo, you will find the solutions, and we don't want you to see the solutions just yet, okay? So what's the problem? <clears throat> the taxis here in the New York City, so they are sending telemetry back to some service every once in a while. Um, every taxi is like sends like every few seconds some, some data and we are going to be recovering the sessions like the taxi trips from, from this data and we can try to do some kind of analysis on top of this data okay so what, 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 what the trips uh, look like uh, how long uh, are they taking or any other property this is a problem to do in a streaming okay because uh, the data is being sent continuously. So here we are working with a batch of data that has been already pre-selected for the workshop and it's a kind of a small, but in reality this is what things will look like, okay? The different taxis will be sending data um, over time, some taxis will have a better connection, uh, like for instance the taxi here at 8 in the morning, so they send the data right away for whatever reason this one send it a little bit later, and I don't know, like, like the transponder, whatever that is, of this taxi, uh, like send the data like hours after, okay? I don't know, like uh, because uh, it didn't work until it got Wi-Fi, whatever, okay? So this is the problem we are going to be solving. Putting together things that belong together um, in a streaming with Apache Bean. Microbatching is not a solution for this, okay? So the problem is that the time when we see the messages and the time when the messages were produced is not the same dimension of time. Uh, and then just grouping things as we receive them is not enough, okay? So we need to do a smarter grouping. And this is because we have two dimensions of time. This time here and this time here, okay? Let, let's. Let's, let's talk about this. We have the so-called processing time and event time. Processing time is when we get to see the things. Event time is when they were actually produced, like Star Wars movies, okay? Star Wars, we got to see the episode, episode, episode 4 in 1977, okay? But in reality, the story started here in episode 1, okay? For whatever reason, we got late data uh, arrival for uh, for the Star Wars movies because it wasn't until 22 years later that we saw episode one, okay? So depending on what you want to do, having things in processing time might be fine, okay? You want to calculate the workload of your servers. 
So how many messages have I have to process per second? Well, processing time is fine because some, some things will not be available until late. But if you want to analyze anything that's a little bit more interesting, you are gonna need event time. Okay, for instance, like family relationships between characters of the Star Wars. Okay, so well. Uh, I don't want to do spoilers. Okay? I don't know if everyone watched here the movies, okay? But things happen in the movies around family relationships, okay? So it's kind of like a like a soap opera. So if you watch the movies in the right order, so you can try to infer these relationships earlier, okay? Um, uh, and they will not be a surprise uh, when when they happen, okay? So if you want to do this, like it said, you want to reconstruct like the family tree of the characters of Star Wars, you have to start in episode one, okay? Or you're gonna have well, surprises, okay? So this is what we want to do here. We want to analyze data on event time, okay? Because we don't care when we see the data. We want to see, uh, for instance, how long is it taking to, to get to the airport, for instance. So we want to have all the sessions to the airports um, and we need to reconstruct this data from, from the streaming. So we need to process things in event time. And grouping things together in micro batching like this doesn't work for that. We need something else. We need windows. And you will be like, hold on, hold on. You said that we cannot group things, and now you're telling me that we need windows. Isn't that grouping things? It is, but in a different way. So see that we have here two dimensions of time. So <clears throat> this is when we see data. This is when data was produced. And this is the dimension that we use to group things together. So this is actually the power of a streaming, of windowing, of the Apache Beam model. Being able to group things together by this dimension, regardless of when we see them, okay? So this is, this is a, the, the trick. <coughs> and there are different types of windows. We will, we will enter maybe later into more details when we, when we uh, start writing the code, okay? But the important thing here is that the grouping is done in this dimension, not in this dimension, okay? Like for instance here, these three belong to this window, session window, whatever, okay? But these three don't belong with this one, okay? And, but we all, we saw these messages together, okay? But somehow we are able to separate them, okay? Because we have this event time, okay? So this is the trick. So there are some concepts in, in Apache Bean that you need to know and that we will be uh, uh, working on uh, through the, the code today, which are here, okay? So the data is stored in a P collection. You probably already know that. Don't worry if you don't know about everything else, because that's the point here. Well, maybe P transform, you should know about that, okay? So everything here and above, it's same as in batch. Now, in a streaming, you need to do additional stuff, which is what is down here, okay? You need to distinguish between event and the processing time. You need to have something that is telling you what's the event time. It could be a timestamp in the data. It could be some kind of external timestamps. It could be something. You need to make a decision about windowing. You need to make a decision about triggerings and watermarks. We will see a little bit more about that uh, later. And we need to see uh, to make a decision about the accumulation mode. Okay. This is a very fine slide that is actually taken from this book here, okay, that I strongly recommend you to read about. It's only 300 pages. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's, it's 300 pages, but, uh, but it's very interesting, okay? So, um, uh, and it's a mom, it, it insists a lot on the concepts of, a, of a streaming. So enough of um, uh, introduction uh, to theory. Um, let's start with the workshop, okay? So this is more or less the pipeline that we're gonna be writing. Don't worry, you are not gonna be writing all the code. You're gonna be writing the interesting stuff, the boring stuff, it's already done there for you. So we're gonna have a file that is gonna be a stream, okay? It's gonna be emulated stream. We're gonna convert it uh, to schemas. We're gonna be using schemas in our pipeline. We will add timestamps, really important. And then we will add keys, okay? Because windows are not only grouped per timestamp, they are also separated magically for us per keys, okay? This is what, it make it, uh, what makes um, Apache Beam Pipeline so scalable. Like different windows in time with different keys will be uh, processed in parallel uh, without us having to do anything. So we will add a window, we will see details about this, and then we will apply some processing. And then when we apply the processing, like grouping by, calculate the statistics, we will write it to the file, 
and then we will visualize it in the system that uh, you have seen at the beginning. Okay, so that's already written. You don't have to write like the dashboard or anything. It's prepared already. It's in a string lit, but you will be you will be able to see the output of your pipeline. And well, coming back to the beginning. So these are the instructions. Okay, so clone the repo if you haven't yet. Uh, follow the readme. We will be now do, doing let's say step by step development. There are two branches. <coughs> that is the main branch, and that is the workshop branch. The main branch has the solutions, but the solutions are poison. Okay, you are here today to learn, and when you look at the solution, it may look more or less obvious. You see, ah, yeah, this is how it's done. That process, it's it's easy. Okay, so that's for your brain, that's sugar. Okay, so it's really it's really it's easy to process. Coming up with that yourself from a blank file. That's much harder, and that's learning. Okay, so please don't look at the solutions because if you look at the solutions and you try to do this process later, you will be tainted already because you have seen the solution. Okay, so please hold on on having a look at the solutions, resist the temptation, and move to this branch. Okay, so we will explain how now in a bit. And this is the branch that you have to look at. Yes. It's actually a workshop, uh, yeah. So it's only it's this, yes. Okay, it's whatever. Okay. So I'm gonna leave this on. Well, actually, I'm gonna change this because uh, I was using here presenter mode. Let's put mirror in, so you, we can see the same stuff. Okay. And now you have seen my secrets. So this is what I was seeing. Okay. So now it's, uh, we're gonna start with the with the actual workshop now. Any question? Is it clear? Anyone lost about uh, what we are expecting uh, to do? Okay, so I think we can start. All right, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Anthony. As usual, I work as a data engineer at Google in the um, cloud professional uh, services team. And um, I'll be doing the coding part of the workshop, which is probably why you're all here. Um, so hopefully you found your way to GitHub into this repo. And um, you can see the workshop branch here in the drop down. And um, if you want to join the coding, you can you need to clone the repo and um, get it set up on your machine. Setup is all detailed in the README, so obviously you need to check out the workshop branch uh, to make sure you're um, working on the, the correct um, set of code. We need uh, an environment, so uh, we built this with Python 3.10. Um, you know, you can use whatever you want to get that set up, but you need a development environment. Today I'll be using VS Code. Uh, you then need to do the following. You need to set up a virtual environment, activate it with these commands here. Finally, you need to initialize the code, so it's always good to upgrade pip, and then we'll install the project of the local package with this command here. Okay, so um, we uh, did a lot of prep work for you today, and um, what we did is we took a public uh, <coughs> pub subtopic and uh, for taxi data, and we basically downloaded it into several files, and we'll be using them today as well. I've also got unit tests, um, and we'll be basically uh, working on the workshop branch and getting all these tests to pass today. So let's jump in to the um, code now. So here. Yeah, but. Exactly, for today's workshop, but you could easily, as we'll see in a minute, just replace the input and the output to be a streaming source, and it, it should still work, yeah. Yes, this um, link will go to the pub subtopic, which is live now, and you can stream from it if you want, but don't do it now. Sure, yeah. yeah, but you can do that after for extra fun, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, okay, so I'm in um, my editor here, it's VS Code, and um, we're gonna jump in to a file in my pipeline called pipeline.py, so hopefully you can find that. And um, we're gonna start, um, at the bottom here on line uh, 205, hopefully you can see it on my screen, I've, I've tried to make it as big as possible for you. Okay, so let's get into it. So you're here to learn about how to build a streaming pipeline step by step. 
And Apache Beam SDK has several useful abstractions to kind of get you started. And uh, we can see some of them here on the screen. The first one is beam.pipeline. And uh, this basically encapsulates our entire data processing task uh, from start to finish, okay? And then we've got, um, from our presentation, remember, P Collections, our old friend, and, and they, they represent the data in Beam, yeah? So we've got our distributed data set that we're gonna operate on. And then we've also got P Transforms, and these are, these are gonna talk about what, what the calculations we're making. And um, um, hopefully you're all familiar with them, but if you're not, you know, a P Transform takes, you know, an input, a P Collection, does some operations, and emits uh, you know, zero or more uh, P Collection objects as output. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about here is kind of like the overall structure. So we already had a great question about, um, you know, what's our input. So basically, uh, our first step is really kind of like an extract step. And at the moment, we're using an inbuilt transform called read from text. But you could easily substitute this for read from Kafka, read from PopSub. And uh, we're reading, um, if you go to the data input folder, you can see an example of this. Um, and our input is basically new line delimited JSON in a file. Each line is a JSON object representing a, a point in a taxi journey. So that's kind of our extract step, yeah? And from that file, we get back a P collection of strings, where each string is a line in that file. The next step is a transform step. And we take that P collection of strings, and we, we do some calculations on it to get back a P collection of dictionaries. And each dictionary is basically containing statistics about that ride. Finally, we have our load which is when we take those statistics and output them somewhere. Uh, for today's workshop, we're gonna just output to a file, but you could change this obviously for your use cases to out output to somewhere else. So we've got our ETL pattern there, familiar pattern. The last thing to say is that you might not be familiar with this pipe operation. Um, hopefully you are, but in case you're not, this is just like a shortcut that they've built in Beam to say, apply a transform to uh, this input P collection and then store it in the output. So that's just like a nice shortcut for say, apply transform. Okay, enough with the basic stuff, let's crack on. So we're gonna go up a little bit now in the file to um, this taxi stats transform on line 186. So basically we talked about extract transform load, ETL, and in the transform step, we have this class taxi stats transform. It takes in a P collection of strings and gives back a P collection of dictionaries. So what is this? Well, this is called a um, composite transform because it um, is a transform that contains many transforms. Um, and this really makes it easy to test our pipeline. We can kind of ignore the input and the output as per the question and just focus on our logic that we're building. And to create a composite transform, the first step is you need to make a class that inherits from P, uh, P transform and you need to override the expand method. And then um, this is like every other P transform. It takes its input a P collection. Here it's called P col and then it does something and it outputs a P collection called stats. So input P collection, do something, output P collection, okay? And um, we can see there are many steps here. And today we're gonna to be working through all these steps and getting them to work by writing some code. So recall that our input here was a P collection of strings. Remember, uh, each string as a line from this file. And our first uh, piece of work is to basically say, I really want to have dictionaries. So we're gonna uh, use a built-in transform called beam.map and um, sorry, uh, and use the json.loads function to uh, transform that p collection of strings into a p collection of dictionaries, okay? That's our first step, okay? Easy, I've already done that for you. And then the next step is we're gonna do um, something called uh, apply schemas, and this uh, makes use of a pattern called par do, do fun. So um, par do, which you can see here, is a bean transform for generic parallel processing. And uh, the way it works is that a uh, Pardu transform considers each element in the input P collection, does some processing on it, and then emits, you know. Great question to a man I've never met before. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. We don't know each other. Thank you. Um, so, um, so Beam kind of sets up a lot of uh, structure for you, but you have to tell it what your boss wants you to do, basically. And uh, when you come to make your own do fun, yeah, you have to subclass the class and then override the process method. When you override the process method, you get a call and it's the call for Mr. Process. And Mr. Process says, you need to agree to this contract. And the contract is, as I said before, let me just get my notes. Um, if you're gonna write process, you need to return an iterable of output elements or none, okay? 
So you can do that in several ways. So you could do something like, instead of yield, you could do something like return a list. Right. So that's kind of like um, option one. And I'll explain why they both work. Option two, and then I'll get on to the next thing. Okay, so these, these option one and option two both kind of uh, agree to the contract, right? And, and uh, in option two, uh, you know, it's an iterable of output elements because it's a list. You can iterate over a list. Done. Contracts, contract agreed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy there. Okay, now yield, what it does, if you haven't used this before in your, your Python journeys, yield creates a generator. And um, it, it, it turns the process into a generator, which is iterable. So basically, that's just another way of um, making this work. So that, that's the first one. Um, then the next one, so this is a, a different uh, um, class structure. It's p.transforms. This is a composite transform and different contracts. And now it's expand. So you get a call for, from Mrs. Expand. Hello, different contract. And uh, this contract is. Um, Take in an input p collection. So here it's called p call because uh, again I'm lazy. I forgot to write the rest of collection. Sorry about that. So p call is our input p collection. Contract says I need to return p collection. So that's why we do a return here of p collection. Okay. Um, so that that's the setup there. Yeah. So so, totally. so, it, it, so here we're using a p transform because we need to divide the like entire different tasks and then. Here we could have actually written also do fn to add, add the keys, but it, so we, since we have already like a high level transform for this, so we just apply high level transform. And in order to like to isolate it in a box for for, for the sake of the testing, and so so we just need to wrap it in a p transform. Okay, so yeah, so and you need to uh, override the expand method and the spark method, so the spec p collection, so and return as a p collection, so you need to use return. And, and yield, you need to use it in the other because it's an iterator. Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks. So this, um, oh, okay. So it's a different pattern. So when you're gonna do the par do, do fun pattern, this, this kind of pair of characters, if you're working with them, what you need to do when you override process Process is invoked for every element of the input p collection. Yeah. So, so think so of this like a lambda, but it's a lambda, but on steroids. You can do a lot of stuff. So maybe here we could actually use just map and a lambda, since the function is really not complex. It's just getting a timestamp and emitting one output. But with a DoFN, you can do a lot of stuff, like um, state and timers, uh, like stateful transformations, like uh, initializations uh, of different objects. Uh, for like to, to be using the process like connections to external databases, whatever. So it's very it's very versatile. It's very powerful. Here we really don't need it. So we, we could just have have to use a, a map, okay? But but we can also use just a DoFN. So so that this is a DoFN. The DoFN is like a super lambda, okay? And then a transform is a way to just to put like a, a, a hierarchy in in the pipeline. Um, let's say for organizational purposes, for to organize your pipeline in different boxes, so to speak, okay? So like Pardu is the transform that you use with a DoFN, okay? So the DoFN kind of lambda, Pardu kind of map, because applies the lambda, and then transforms is, would you put transforms inside transforms, inside transforms? P transforms, P -transforms yes, P transforms. I say transforms, but uh, P transforms, yeah. P transforms is just a way to wrap things together, Okay, like a, like a chunks of pipelines. Okay, and just it's a matter of um, a style, even I would say. So how you group things together? It's totally, it's totally, let's say, metadata. Okay, so it really doesn't have any kind of semantic effect. It doesn't affect the, the, the output of the calculation. It's just let's say grouping things together. It's it's like when you organize things in functions and classes and all that. So you could put functions instead of functions and so on. Okay, so. Um, uh, so and you can and you could do it in many different ways. Okay, so here we are doing it in this way because we need to put different bits separate to be able to test them. Uh, so you can have like this unit testing, like progressive unit testing, like first tax two, then tax three, then tax four, and so on. Okay. So. Yes, they could be inter. Yes, they could be. No, part two is a p transform. You could put uh, put a part two inside the p transform. Okay. So a P transform is just a way to uh, to group things together for for organizational purposes. Yeah. 
Like you can put a function inside another function, and pardo is a type of p transform. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and maybe you you should remove the the code you wrote uh, up or the tests are the tests are gonna fail like line eighty seven. Right. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll just move on quickly then to the next thing, um, yes. and we can take more questions after, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, so um, like I said, it's the most exciting thing. Let's get back to that most exciting thing. That's what I was saying. And um, <laughs> this is about sessions. So you came to this session to learn about sessions. Yahoo! So let's get into it. So we've got um. Uh, on task number four, um, we've got another unit test. Let's see if that uh, fails. Hopefully it will, and we can make it pass. So we've got, um, great, uh, failed. So basically, what we need to do then is, is identify, uh, we've got a stream, and we want to identify sessions of events, okay? So how are we going to do this? So it's, again, it's a composite transform. So it inherits from P transform. We override the expand method. We have that contract we need to sort out. And the way we're going to do this is make a variable called windowed. It's a P collection of um, tuples. Um, this is the output of our key uh, uh, work from before, where the string is a key, and then it, it, it uniquely uh, keys the, um, all the taxi points of a write together. And what we're going to do, we're going to pass that input p collection uh, into uh, a built-in beam transform called window into. And I'm just going to write out the, the attribute, the, the method attribute to this, and then we're going to work through each one and explain what's going on. So window function, uh, the next one's trigger, next one's uh, accumulation mode, and the final one's allowed lateness. Okay, great. And then we need to return, and that's the contract there. So. Great. Okay. Cool. So um, let's let's get going here. So hopefully you can see all that, and I'll, I'll start with uh, window font. Okay. So so remember from the presentation, uh, one of the things you need to know about streaming is that you need to tell Beam where in event time to calculate. And a window function subdivides the P collection according to the timestamps of individual elements. Okay. And uh, here, today, we're going to divide our P collection into session windows, with each session separated by a gap. Okay? Now, we could have picked fixed windows or sliding windows, but they're not appropriate for today. Okay? We're going to use session windows. Okay? And this is applied on a per-key basis, a per-write ID. Okay, so let's get coding. So we said we're going to use session windows. In Beam, very easy. You just do sessions. And then the argument that we apply in, uh, pass in to the constructor here is the gap between the, uh, the gap between events to identify sessions. So this translates to eight minutes in case your brain is severely hungover and you don't know what 480 seconds is. And eight minutes, how do we work at eight minutes? So basically, I worked it out by looking at the data for a long time. And uh, you, know, you can imagine there's kind of like tunnel problems, connectivity problems. You know, maybe eight minutes is reasonable. But for your pipeline, you'd have to experiment with this. Okay? For today, we're going with eight minutes. Okay? So that's the gap between events in our stream both, uh, by, uh, with which we identify when one session ends. So let's say an event happens, eight minutes pass, and then another event happens. Because there's an eight minute gap, we've got two sessions. Okay? That's what that's doing for us. Okay, super. So, and um, we have a lot left to do, so let's move on. So, trigger. So, remember from the presentation, the other thing you need to know with streaming is that you need to tell Beam when in processing time to emit results. Okay? So, this first one is uh, where in event time to calculate. The next one is when in processing time, so a different time. Uh, measure to emit results. Right, let's talk about that. So Windows alone, they're not going to do anything for you, okay? So you need a trigger to specify when in processing time a window should generate output, okay? You've got a couple options, two main flavors, if you will. Repeated updates. So this is when you say, I want my Windows to give me an update every minute. Every minute. Give me an update every minute, okay? Or you could go with the completeness flavor, which is, I want my window to give me output when all the data is there. Okay? Now, how on earth are we going to do this? Well, for today's workshop, we want the completeness uh, kind of flavor of trigger. And the way we can set this up in the code is use uh, a built in Beam functionality called after watermark. What is a watermark? I hear you screaming. Please quiet down. So, a watermark is a measure of input completeness in event time. And basically, after watermark means uh, approximately when this window has all of its data. Okay? So um, that's uh, uh, basically how we do this. And then we move on to the next one, accumulation mode. And um, accumulation mode uh, basically tries to answer the question, um, sorry, uh, how um, 
to uh, do refinements of results relate. Okay. All right, what on earth am I talking about here? Basically, we added a trigger, and so we're required to add an accumulation mode, okay? And uh, if you have a setup where you decided to go into the repeated updates flavor of trigger, so you have, say, an update every minute, all right? What do you do with those updates? Okay, and the accumulation mode um, helps you decide that. You can, you can join them together, you can, you can do all kinds of things, right? For us today, we only uh, want... You can, you can do deltas yes, or you can you. do accumulated. So thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, for today's workshop, uh, we're just going to keep it simple because we want all the data to arrive for our session before we fire an, an output. We're just going to discard, uh, which is the, the default value. So we do accumulation. And we have a single trigger as well, so, so that will be no really, it, it really doesn't matter if you have a single trigger per window, so it really doesn't matter. Yeah, thanks. And then the last one is allowed lateness. So you have to decide like, what happens when your data arrives late. Um, and so for this, today's workshop, we're just going to do um, just basically say this. We're going to just say, um, you know, just forget about it. Just making things simple today. Lots of other options here, but you can see the documentation for your options. So we have to uh, crack on, lots to cover. So um, we, we talked about all these points. Maybe you're a bit lost. Let me try to help you out, okay? When you write your, your pipeline, you have to decide between a few things, okay? You need to come up with a balance uh, of the following. Completeness, latency, and cost, okay? So for completeness, you really need to decide, do you need all your data before you compute a result? For latency, you need to decide how long can you wait for your data. Do you need it ASAP, or can you just wait until it all arrives? Okay, cost. You need to decide how much uh, your budget is. Uh, how much are you willing to spend on compute to get your latency low, okay? So completeness, latency, cost. Let me give you some examples to make this concrete. Anti-fraud, okay? You probably want, um, uh, you know, you don't need all your data maybe. You want to make a decision as quickly as possible, so low latency, and you're willing to spend for that, okay? So low completeness, low latency, high cost, okay? Anti-fraud. Billing, completely different. You want to wait for all the data to come, obviously, for billing. You don't mind waiting, and you definitely don't want to spend money with billing, right? It's the opposite. You want to bill, not be paying people. So you've got to make these decisions when you design your pipeline, okay? So that's the balance you have to strike. Okay, um, let's move on then. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I didn't see you there. Go on, go on. So how do you decide the consensus of data? Like, what is this endpoint that you need? Like, I'm not gonna say my data is complete. Ah, good question. So I'll try to answer it, but I think my, my um, yeah, maybe I can answer yeah. that. So that's the watermark definition. It's a little bit complex. So, so basically, when, when, so the watermark is kind of a clock that is global for the pipeline that moves um, according to some rules, like using the all the stand stamps of the messages waiting to be processed. Whenever you have a message that uh, goes over the watermark, okay, so then you consider that that window is complete. Okay, when you 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 are receiving, you have a window. The window has time boundaries. Okay, when, when the second bump, like the end of the window, goes over the watermark, it means that it's probably complete, okay? And then the watermark keeps being recalculated based on the pace of arrival of data. It's kind of an estimation that the, well, if we have probably, let's say, if things continue being like they were before, so we have probably seen all the, all the data that we, have, uh, we should have seen. So it's purely based on time. It's not based on the properties of the data. It's not based on whether we have seen the drop of a message or if we, ha we have seen any kind of a, spe um, a specific type of message. Okay, it's purely based on time. And that's why you sometimes may want to, to allow for some lateness, okay? Your window goes over the watermark, but well, you are not sure. Mm, what if I get a message after this, okay? Because well, so things can, may arrive late, so you may wait a little bit more than that, okay? But then if you wait more, then you will have like more problems of latency. The more you wait, the more likely that you will have seen all your data, but you will have to wait longer. So it's always this trade-off between how, how long I wait um, and how complete the data will be or how much risk I take of the data not being complete. You can also use other criteria, like for instance, uh, when I see specific types of messages, and in the workshop we're gonna be doing later, we're actually doing that, but with state and timers, not based with, with Windows. Okay, so. Uh, uh, one hour or a day, then the window will wait 
considered in this result because it knows it has to it has seen an event from the day today. The previous day might be over, but it has a, some. Uh, here we have a lot of latency of zero seconds, but it could be one hour. So for the billing example, there is this is what 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 is meant when we say like okay, we we're going to we want to have complete results. Of course, you're never sure. You never you can you can't because there can always be some delay event. But that's where you have um, refinements basically, where you can say okay, if I get a later event than that, I still want to do recalculation, for example, for billing. We can talk more later, yeah, thanks. Good question. Okay, cool, so let's run that unit test. Uh, let's see if we're getting paid today. Ooh, drum roll. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Great, all right, cool. Um, moving on to task five. So before we do that, we're gonna do a quick recap in case um, you've, uh, you've gone onto uh, your Facebook or whatever you're doing nowadays. So what on earth are we doing today? Right, so yes, I took a whole bunch of taxi rides last night. Here's a sample. Uh, we've got our new line delimited JSON file. Each line is a point along a taxi journey. We came in, we said, make me a P collection of strings, then make me a P collection of dictionaries. Then I really don't like them, so I wanna have these taxi point instances I can work with. I'm gonna timestamp them, so Beam knows what event time means for my pipeline. And then I'm gonna identify a unique key across related taxi points for the same taxi ride. And then I'm going to make sessions. This is what we just did. So we can identify um, you know, sessions uh, in our stream. Now we're gonna group them. So this is where that key comes in now. So hopefully um, all the people asking questions about keys before, I can see them uh, coming to light now, coming to some usefulness. So what are they gonna do for us? So if we've got our input, and as you can see on this first kind of column, there's this uh, consistent ride ID across all our taxi points in the same ride, okay? We wanna group them together, okay? So we're gonna to group together all these points into the same uh, collection, and that's what's happening here. So it's a tuple, of strings, which is the ride ID, and per ride ID, we're gonna have a list of all the taxi points in that ride ID, okay? That's what that's doing there, it's a group by operation, using the built-in transform group by key. Okay, so we've come to the, you know, the, the really cool stuff now, which is we're gonna actually go in to these sessions and do some calculations, okay? And that's what we're gonna see later on in the dashboard, okay? So let's get to it. We're gonna go up to task number five. And task number five, it's, it's, well, this is kind of like the most verbose code in, in today's workshop. It's another example of this par do, do fun pattern. So we've got a class that inherits from um, do fun. And it's, this time it has a constructor. We haven't seen one of these before. So this constructor makes use of some uh, counters, they're called, okay? And counters um, can, uh, in this use case, we're, we're imagining a stream, let's say Kafka, because uh, someone brought that up, or PubSub, and uh, they're coming in, and the timestamps, you know, some of them are a bit wonky, you know, something went wrong, you know? Uh, the the timestamp machine had a bad day sometimes. And so we wanna make a, a little note of uh, correct timestamps and malformed timestamps. In this constructor, we set it up like this, using these, uh, these counters, okay? And then, uh, you know, timestamps, as we can all relate to later, over a few beers, it's, it's a, you know, there's a nightmare. We've done a bit of work for you to make parsing easy, okay? And then um, we come down to, remember this contract. If I've got a do fun, I'm getting that call from Mr. Do fun. Process, you need to adhere to the contract. Here we are, we're in the process thing, but this one looks a little bit different to before. Okay, so what's going on? So before we just had self and element, okay? Where each element was an element in the P collection we're applying this, this do fun on, okay? Now we've got two extra friends. We've got window and pain info, okay? Lots of fun for you, lucky people. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is understand that element is a tuple, okay? So we are applying this uh, do fun to a P collection of tuples, okay? And each element is a tuple where the first item is a string, that's our ride ID, and the second point is a list of all the taxi points in that taxi ride. Are you with me? Yeah, cool. Okay, let's unpack that. We're gonna unpack that with this Python trick. So we pull out the ride ID and the list of taxi points. Okay, and then we're going to do a trick. Uh, we're gonna make some dictionaries of statistics and then at the end, we're gonna make a big sandwich, a dictionary sandwich. You've never had one before, they're delicious. So we're gonna take all our dictionaries and we're gonna just squish them together and then give them back, okay? Into a big dictionary, okay? And what we're gonna do now is go through how we're gonna do this for each step. So the, the first one's easy. We're just gonna say, uh, yeah, we just need to pull out the right ID for this uh, collection of statistics. Easy, done, first dictionary. And then we've got these three functions, okay? And each function makes use of a different um, 
input to the process method. The first function is going to make use of the, the element, specifically that list of taxi points we've got inside it, and it's called taxi point analyzer. The next one will make use of window, and then the final one will make use of pane info, okay? So that's the structure we're going through now, okay? So just stick with me, we're almost there. It's three steps to home, people, okay? So let's get into the first one, taxi point analyzer. Okay, so this is the most verbose code, but uh, uh, so hopefully just stick with me. And uh, what it's gonna do is take its input, uh, a list of taxi points, and it's gonna return a dictionary. The dictionary has this shape. We wanna work out when in event time did the taxi ride start, the min timestamp, when did it end in max timestamp, okay? What was the initial status and what was the end status? You know, was it, is it starting with pick up and then drop off? That's the ideal, maybe something went wrong. How many points in this taxi ride were there? Um, you know, 20, 100, you know, did I get super drunk last night and go all the way around Manhattan? And then the duration, you know, how long was I in the taxi for? Uh, you know, how many uh, seconds in there? So that's what we're gonna calculate, right? So how can we do this? So what we can do, we can just iterate over um, all the elements in the input list, okay? So we can do something like this. We can do something like taxi point in uh, points, and we can do something like event timestamp um, sorry. So we can use our inbuilt parse function to uh, take the one element of our um, uh, list of taxi points and use its timestamp attribute. Okay, so that's how we're gonna get uh, just the, the timestamp of this uh, taxi point. And then we can also pull out the ride status um, in a similar way. So taxi point uh, dot ride status, okay. So if, yeah, so taxi point or timestamp or ride status, that's from the schema at the top of the flock. That's, that's, the, that's the structure there. Again, that's why we're using schemas. It makes our code easier to reason about. Okay, so um, computing stats. So we're gonna do something like, um, if in our dictionary, uh, GPS signal lost, okay, wow. Someone is definitely having that, that, fun. That can happen in streaming a lot of times, so that's why we need to check the init and then the status. So they should be pick up and drop off, but sometimes GPS signal is lost and and then you don't, you don't get that data, so. Yeah. And that happens quite <laughs> often. <laughs> okay, just stick with me, people. So this, we're almost there, okay? So we're gonna, um, basically, we're looping through, and we're gonna try and work out when did our taxi ride start. So we're looking for this min timestamp, okay? So we're just gonna say, you know, it's, it's, it's typical stuff here, so. Um, So if this is the first time that we are populating the dictionary, so we populate it with whatever we have seen. And now, if for whatever reason, so we have found a minimum, so we calculate the minimum. So, so th see here, so we, we can sort data to do any kind of complex calculation, and this is in the streaming, because we have now a group, in a group by key, in a window, etc. Okay, so, so basically here, we, imagination is the limit of what we can do. So we can apply anything. So, so in the streaming, in big data, so you can only do a cumulative, um, um, commutative and associative operations. Uh, and so there are certain restrictions for the kind of things that you can do. But here you can do anything because this group is a local list. So you can do literally anything. So things that you can't do is like the median and you can only do an average. So an example, a median is actually a better value because it's an outlier time to say, so this is possible with this, for example. Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a typical example, average versus median. So median, you cannot do it in parallel. But if you have a group already, and you can, you can sort it or iterate over it, so you can calculate it. Okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, so it's pretty simple code. You can just follow on this looping through. You're calculating some of the statistics, and uh, we get to the end. And, and now we've got some useful statistics you can actually compute other statistics with, like, for example, duration. Um, so we can say uh, the duration. It's, you know, it's really easy to calculate now. We just do something like the difference between the max and the min. Sorry. Okay, and then we can just do something like total seconds after that. Okay, and then we can also just do some, some kind of a nice uh, processing of the data so we can read it later on. And we can do something like um, ISO format the timestamps, and um, yeah, 
that, that, that pretty much will do it for this function. So just to recap, we, we took in all those uh, taxi points, we went through them, we computed some statistics, and then we shot that back to the caller here, down here, okay? All right, okay, so now we'll move on to something a bit more interesting, so, um, uh, which is about looking into the window. So remember, process, it comes in, and it's got this, this new window thing, okay? And it's a beam.dofun.windowparam. Very exciting name. We're gonna pass it to window analyzer. It's just woken up, it's ready to go. So window analyzer, what's it doing? So it's taking in a window, a beam.dofun.windowparam. It's giving us back a dictionary of statistics. So this one, I've just, I've just ran the code, so I'll just talk through it. So basically, I need you to remember that in this context, we're working on a per window, per key basis, okay? So whatever we're doing here applies to one session of one write ID, okay? And we wanna know for this one session of this one write ID, when did the window start and when did it end? Well, Beam's got us covered. We just say window, this beam.dofun.windowparam, it's got a start attribute, and it's got this very well-named function. I mean, easy to remember. Basically, it's just an, an ISO format. It just gives you back a nice representation of that timestamp, okay? Um, so that's all it does. So that we're done with that, we pass that back, and then we move on to the next and last one, okay? So just stay with me, people, we're almost there. So, it's called uh, Pain Analyzer. So I originally came up with this naming here, but it turned out that that wasn't a very appropriate for today's workshop. So we've gone with the more appropriate version here. Okay, so pain. So it's, a, it's an instance of beam do fun pain info parameter, okay? So we're talking about pains here. So let's jump into it and get, and get, and get going. So what is a pain? You might be thinking you're a pain, but you're wrong. <laughs> a pain is the following. We have to have a little build up, okay? A trigger specifies when in processing time a window should generate output, okay? And each specific output of a window is referred to as a pane of that window. So you have a window maybe in your house and the glass is called a pane, right? So it's the, a pane of that window. And remember the watermark is a measure of completeness in event time. So approximately when we say after watermark, it means the window has all of its events. Alrighty, so what we're gonna do here is and the you're following. you're gonna have only one, one pane here per window, but if you had several, so you, had, uh, you, could, you could have several panes per window. So, so this is very useful to debug what's going on with your streaming pipeline, okay? So because you have a mental model of what you want to do, but then in streaming, anything can happen. So data will come as they will come, so you want to know when your window is closed, when your data is being emitted, so maybe you thought it's going to be emitted like three times per window and you're discovering that it's now like five times, whatever. And if it was early, if it was on time, if it was late, okay? So and then this helps you later on to refine the decisions that you made at the beginning, the type of window, the type of trigger, and so on. Okay, so it's an iterative process. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing here, yeah. There's basically um, some magic numbers. Um, they're similar to magic mushrooms, but the experience is not as fun. So the magic numbers here, we need uh, zero, one, and two, and uh, they correspond to early pains, on-time pains, and late pains. So that, that's what we're doing here. So, so this, is, this could be potentially useful for your applications, as, as my uh, Israel just said, okay? So, so that's that. Um, so let's check if, I've, uh, if I'm still got a job or I'm fired by running the unit test. So. Um, we are in task number five. Let me just grab the unit test for that. Sorry. Hopefully my uh, code is typo-free. Oh, still got a job. <laughs> Happy days. All righty. Okay, we've reached the end. Thanks for sticking with me. And now we get to run the thing. So, we've got lots of instructions in the readme. We're gonna run it now. Yeah, we're gonna invoke it like this. We say the runner is the direct runner because we're, we're just trying to keep it simple today. We're in streaming mode and we're gonna have this, you know, this kind of this input and we're gonna get to this output. Let's see if it works. Let's see if it blows up. So, we're in our terminal. We're gonna copy paste, off it goes. Da -da -da -da. It's done, yay. So let's go check out the output. So remember the input, We've seen it so many times now, you're gonna be dreaming about it tonight. <laughs> it's this new line delimited JSON file. Let's see what happens in the output. So we're gonna to go to our Fly Explorer, we're gonna to go to data, output, da da da, and we've got some output there, woohoo! And it's uh, statistics about our taxi ride. Thank you very much. All right, now, we've got seven minutes left, and we're gonna show you something 
even more amazing. I know. <laughs> I'll say goodbye now. My colleague will take over. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick since uh, we are almost out of time. And if I can find where is the code uh, here. Okay, yes. Okay, so uh, there's another uh, repo. Okay, so you, you have it also in, in the slides. Um, uh, 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 let me see if I can make myself here around. Yes. Okay, it's about visualization, uh, visualizing the visualizing the data that you just produced, okay? Um, it has been a little bit difficult to explain the problem given like the short time that we had uh, for, for the workshop and we had some questions around that. So hopefully the combination of the code, the unit testing and the visualization of the output so can help you understand let's say, what's the rationale behind the, what we are doing, okay? So I think everything is already installed here and I'm gonna take this one here, okay? So to like half a visualization of the full data. So this is gonna um, create a, oh, it's actually open here the tab, okay? So this is a, a dashboard with all the data that we have calculated. Well, it's actually one, only one, um, not all. I, 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 let, let me actually, let, can I repeat it with, the, with everything? Let me just, let me just uh, control C here. And then I'm gonna do it with, let me, I don't see anything because of the terminal. Let me see. If, here, this one. Um, where is it? Really ah, here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna take all this. Okay, all this data. This is already actually pre-calculated. It's not the same data that we have uh, produced today, but you can also like uh, uh, produce it. Okay, so so this is the data that uh, that we receive. Uh, like isolated points in a map with some properties. Okay, in this case, around forty thousand points. And then we need to group them together somehow. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So this is what we have done in our pipeline. Basically, we have grouped together rights. So this is the input. This is the, the, the same input as the, um, the same table as, as the input, same format. Okay. These are the after applying the TAN stamp, after applying the key, the window in, and then this is the output. Okay, like for instance, let me sort here by duration. This has been one of the lo longest uh, sessions that we have had, okay? With only 11 points, okay, but for well, for whatever reason, because, well, so we may lose data, and in this case, it's just like a sample of data, some sampling, okay? So we are definitely losing data. So let me copy this, and if I go up, if I make myself around, if I go up here, and I copy paste here the ID, let's see what we get. So these are the sessions, okay? So, well, like like the transponder of this taxi is a little bit broken. It's just sending data like uh, sometimes. Okay, but this is what we have done with our pipeline. So we have found this group together, and then we have calculated calculated some some properties. Okay, um, like the number of points or, or the duration. Okay, like like the properties that are down here. Okay, or the minimum time stamp and the maximum time stamp. This is what we have done for our pipeline, okay, with the trigger on time, because, well, so this is what we, we, we were using, okay? If, we, if I remove again this here and uh, I have a look at, no, at another point, let me see if I can have another one here, statistics per window, um, duration, let me take, I don't know, let me take this one here, that is 87 points, okay? The data is not necessarily going to make a lot of sense because it's a, it's anonymized, okay? It's just, let's say, like a dummy data for the, uh, showcasing a streaming, okay? Like this one, like this guy did all this trip in 271 seconds, probably not, okay? Or, or maybe yes, I don't know. Like, I mean, like I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the US because it's so advanced <laughs> in technology, so you never know. Okay, but so, but uh, here it's, um, so here you have a trip, okay? So did we have, isolated this from all the data, put it together and calculated some properties, okay? And we have done this in, in parallel for every taxi, in parallel for every session, in parallel, okay? Without really having to write a lot of code by just making the decision about the windowing and the key, okay? This is why making the right decisions about this is so important because there's a lot of magic happening behind for us that allows us to simply calculate this kind of, uh, of properties by by just like um, iterating list, which is what we have done, okay? But the, 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 the list itself, it has been been, Apache being the one that has uh, come up with that, with that list. So, well, this was it. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about the streaming, okay? So remember, 
It says send as batch plus additional decisions, windowing, trigger, accumulation mode, and so on. And if you make sensible decisions about this, well, you will be able to get a lot of power from your uh, pipeline without having to do a lot of code. Imagine that having to do the instant streaming, coming up with a session in algorithm by yourself, it's, it's, and doing that with the, the performance that we have seen is instantaneous. Okay, so so this is what the streaming in Apache Bean is about. Okay, so well, um, no, don't know. We have time. One minute for questions. One more minute for questions. Questions? Anyone? Well, so well, so there. Thanks, thanks for yeah. Question here. What mark is this? What mark usually is for resource? This is a very good question. So watermark, it, it starts at the source, but every step in the pipeline, when after it happens, it has its own watermark as well. Okay, so, so the watermark propagates through, through the pipeline. So it's not only at the source. The source has to provide a time stamp because if without that, so, so we cannot start calculating the watermark, but the watermark propagates throughout the pipeline, yes. The, the, the watermark is a tiny, it's a tiny, it's like a clock, okay? It's like you have a watch here in your, on your well, I don't have one, but, uh, I'll, uh, well, you do, okay, great. So, so you, this moves one second at a time, right? So the watermark is like that, it's a clock, but it's a, except that every second, uh, it's a clock that it depends on the event timestamp, and it moves as it data arrives, okay? And it's always the oldest timestamp that has not been processed yet. Okay, in every of the steps in the pipeline. Okay, that's how it's calculated. Okay, so and so the, the, when you are processing data, so hopefully your data will be coming through your pipeline, and then the all the time stamp will keep progressing to, towards the future. Uh, sometimes your pipeline will be quicker, sometimes it will be slower, depending on the kind of calculations that you are doing, and that will move the watermark. Okay, so when you have seen already a message, when you have processed already a message with a certain time stamp. The watermark assumes that you don't expect seeing messages with older timestamps, okay? So the pipeline makes sure, let's say, to grab the data and process the data as it goes, okay? But then if later on you get a message with an older timestamp, the latest message that you have processed, then that's a late message, and, okay? And if you don't wait for it, like we have we, we here, we, let's say we haven't wait for it, so that's dropped by the pipeline when you apply the window, okay? So. It's not linear, it's not linear. It depends a lot on the pace of arrival of the data to your pipeline. Sometimes it will move quicker, sometimes it will be slower. It depends on the actual data. It's defined by the event timestamp, and it's defined by the event timestamp of the oldest message still waiting to be processed. So it, it totally depends on the data. No, no, it's not fixed. It's not fixed. It's moving with the data. Okay, so so that, that's why we are so here. So we we are able to see this because the window was closed because the watermark moved with the data. Like the unit is processing. Or? Uh, the unit is it's a time. It's a time. It's like a time stamp. It's, it's like um, 2023 June 8. To, what what day is today? I don't know. I don't even it's like it's like right now. Okay, yeah. like it's a, it's a time stamp. Like date, time down to the millisecond. It's a time stamp. It's, a t it's, it's like a, a watch. Okay, so the watch is giving you the time and it's moving. So this is not configurable. No, no, no. It is not configurable. It's defined. So the, let's say the, the, each one of the runners and the sources that you can read data from define a, how the, the watermark is calculated. Like here, we kind of emulated it by uh, adding the time stamps by hand because we're using files. Okay, if you were using PubSub. PubSub provides a, a definition of the timestamp. Kafka, another definition with data flow. Uh, Toby. Uh, 